Hi everyone, welcome to video 3 of 4 on electrochemistry. We're in chapter 18. Today's video will cover sections 18.3 and 18.4. They deal with uh, the relationship between cell potential and free energy and a lot of the underlying theory that goes into it. Uh, we'll also then look at uh, what happens when we change concentrations in our electrochemical cells, uh, what happens then to the, uh, the energy and the cell potential in that case. All right, so let's get started. All right, recall the electromotive force is then the electrical potential difference between the anode and the cathode. So that is the voltage that is produced in an electrochemical cell. Um, we, again, more commonly call it cell potential. Uh, remember capital E, subscript cell, um, and the cell potential can be positive or negative. Uh, so the cell potential is measured in units of volts. Uh, so when we have our half cell reactions, we combine those to get our overall cell uh, potential. Uh, recall that one volt is equal to one joule per coulomb. So if we have these units, we'll be able to look at and characterize our system in a variety of different ways. So recall, a joule is an energy unit, a coulomb is a unit of charge, um, and so a volt is related to then uh, the amount of energy per charge unit. All right, a uh, coulomb specifically is the SI unit of charge. The charge on one electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So we'll more typically deal with, uh, say, a mole of electrons, as we'll get to in a minute. Uh, if we have a mole of electrons, we can relate that then to Faraday's constant. All right, so let's look then uh, at electrochemical or electrical work. So the Gibbs energy of a cell is equal to the potential electrical work or chemical work, uh, which is equal to uh, the negative charge in coulombs uh, times then the cell potential. All right, and so in this expression, the work, electric work, is the work done by the cell on the system. Remembering in some engineering contexts, uh, this is um, opposite by convention. Uh, in this case, though, our, our system uh, is the cell, uh, and it's doing work on its surroundings, uh, which, again, might be a battery then discharging into a foam. C is the charge in coulombs. E is the electromotive force, cell potential, or voltage. And finally then, if a volt is one joule per coulomb, um, if we put units in this uh, top expression here, we can get that the Gibbs energy, or the work, must be in units of joules. All right. So again, uh, we'll often want to work with uh, the amount of charge. And if we want to do that, we'll much more commonly want to deal with units of moles rather than individual electrons. And so to, to deal with that, we have Faraday's constant, abbreviated capital F. Uh, Faraday's constant is 9.65 times 10 to the 4 coulombs per mole of electrons. So if we take the charge on one single electron from the previous slide, multiply it by Avogadro's number, that's how we get then uh, the Faraday constant. Um, we can also then change the units. Remember, many of these units are going to be interconvertible. Uh, Faraday's constant can also be expressed as 96.485 kilojoules per volt mole electrons. All right, so again, these units um, may help us then uh, dis describe our system in different terms. Um, in any expression uh, that we're going to be then working with or any e equation that we're going to be working with, we're going to now use n as the number of moles of electrons. And this is not to be confused with the moles of, say, substrate or moles of anything else. It's simply the moles of electrons being transferred. All right, so we can relate uh, Faraday's constant to the charge by multiplying then the uh, Faraday's constant by the number of moles. So if we do this, we'll note that we can substitute this expression, this n times f, our number of moles times Faraday's constant, into this expression up here and get a really useful expression. And so therefore, when we make that substitution, the change in the Gibbs energy of the cell is equal to uh, the negative number of moles of electrons transferred times Faraday's constant times the cell potential. 
All right, so this expression um, will, again, allow us to then relate cell potentials uh, to the thermodynamic drive uh, that makes them work. So if a Gibbs energy is uh, negative, the Gibbs energy of a cell is negative, well, that cell then is going to spontaneously dissipate when connected to a circuit. So a battery will discharge when it's full. Uh, as then a battery is discharging, as an example, uh, it could be just a regular uh, galvanic or voltaic cell. Uh, as it's discharging, the concentrations are changing in, uh, in that system, and eventually it's reaching equilibrium, and then a dead battery uh, is now at a situation where the Gibbs energy is equal to zero, and it's no longer going to have any uh, elect uh, potential to do work. We'll look at all of these different... Um, uh, different ways that we can look at the Gibbs energy of our system in just a minute. Uh, but first, let's look at ways that we can define our, uh, our system uh, using different types of units. Alright, um, and this is again uh, both theoretical and, and uh, initially starts to become practical uh, when we're dealing with systems like batteries or even photovoltaic cells or uh, things like that. So from a practical standpoint, one of the most important characteristics of a battery is its ability to do work. So we have a negative Gibbs energy. It's able to dissipate that energy um, through a circuit and do something for us. All right. So if we had this expression, um, we can then express a battery capacity in coulombs times volts or joules. So the joules, the Gibbs energy of a battery, will tell us the total amount of energy that we have to do work. So the battery capacity in joules is one uh, potential way that we can express how much work is available uh, in that system. All right, so the other important units related to a batteries and other electrochemical cells, right? uh, the current is uh, in units of amperes. Uh, what that actually is measuring is the amount of charge that passes over um, a point per second. So the number of coulombs delivered per second. Uh, an ampere then is one ampere is one coulomb per second. Uh, we can also then, uh, by substitution, uh, get new units on coulombs. Uh, we can say that those are then amp seconds. So this is again just using these identities to be able to uh, switch units around to get them in a form that might be most appropriate to descri describe our system. All right, we also then have units of power. So power is an amount then of energy that's delivered uh, over time. So a volt, one watt is the unit of power, and it has the units of volts times amps, or joules per second. Uh, the more, more useful one, I feel like, is joules per second, because uh, that again tells us how much work we're delivering to our system per second, or how much potential work. Um, and I say potential work because we're never going to max out our work, um, the amount of power, or the amount of, sorry, energy uh, that's being delivered is a theoretical maximum. There's always going to be some inefficiency there. All right, so anyway, a cell producing the one volt of potential and one amp of current will produce one watt of power. So again, these are all uh, identities um, that are covered in appreciably more detail in your physics course, uh, but they'll be useful for us looking at um, electrochemical cells and being able to describe them uh, using, again, current, how much charge is being delivered to our system, uh, power, how much en energy per time, etc. Alright, so if we have then a quantity of power, um, again, it's a joule per second being delivered uh, to our system, uh, then we can look at power consumption. Uh, so power consumption then is uh, typically in units of kilowatt hours. Uh, this is how your house uh, is typically measured for its power consumption. Uh, there's the analogous um, concept of power supply, how much power is being delivered. Uh, in any case, kilowatt hours um, is we're going to have then a thousand watts um, delivered for one hour, and so we can calculate our other, um, we can interconvert then these units for what we actually might end up wanting to use them for. All right, so let's do some actual practical calculations here, though. So the calculate the value of, of the Gibbs energy and the work capacity for the circuit for this reaction here. We have magnesium, zero valent magnesium, plus copper ions, making magnesium two plus and copper solid. Uh, so in a voltaic cell, uh, this produces 2.71 volts. So one thing to note here right away, it doesn't matter uh, for this expression 
whether we have something that is in its standard state. So we, if we had say one molar copper and one molar magnesium, uh, it doesn't matter. Well, it's only dependent on the voltage, and that's from our expression here. So the Gibbs energy is the, the negative change in the number of moles times Faraday's constant times cell potential. That could be the standard cell potential, and then we'd be able to relate this to the standard Gibbs energy of that reaction. Uh, but for now, while it, again, it doesn't matter, we're not going to distinguish it. All we need is a uh, voltage that we've measured from our cell. We also need the number of moles. So in this case, uh, this is a two electron transfer, right? So this is where having that balanced uh, reaction comes in, comes in handy. This is an extremely simple redox reaction, but redox reactions can get complicated. And so we need to know, again, the no total number of moles of electrons being transferred. In this case, it's going to be two. All right, so we have everything we need to calculate then uh, the Gibbs energy. We know the number of moles, the voltage is given. We know Faraday's constant. We'll just plug in those numbers. Uh, we have the only thing left to consider though uh, is the appropriate units on Faraday's constant. Uh, if we have our cell potential in volts and we have then the number of moles of electrons being transferred, we must use uh, this unit for Faraday's constant, which will result in, if we cancel out volts and electrons, uh, units of kilojoules for our Gibbs energy. All right, so when we do that, uh, we get a value of negative 523 kilojoules. All right, so we have the Gibbs energy for this reaction. So if we transfer then uh, two moles of electrons in this reaction at this uh, particular cell voltage, this is going to be the amount of energy, uh, the amount of uh, potential work available uh, from this cell. All right. Um, so again, conveniently, this is the energy available to do work. And again, for practical purposes, um, this is a uh, the theoretical maximum. There will always be system inefficiencies. All right, so one thing to note here is that this relies on a voltage that, uh, that has been provided in the problem. Uh, so this is the only time we'll be able to use uh, this uh, expression directly. Uh, otherwise, what will be more common is that we'll be given a composition of a cell. So what will happen is we'll have, say, this system here, uh, magnesium, metal, and copper metal, in baths then of their ions. And we might be given then a concentration of those ions. And from there, we might have to calculate a voltage to plug into this expression. So that's what we'll work on uh, next. So to do that, we use a uh, really useful uh, equation called the Nernst equation. And this is what we, how we calculate voltages for non-standard conditions for electrochemical cells. All right, so this comes then uh, from the underlying, again, thermodynamic properties of this system. So again, the reason why we have electric, uh, the potential for chemical or electrical work is because we're out of equilibrium. All right, so recalling then this expression, the Gibbs energy is equal to then the standard Gibbs energy plus the gas constant times the Kelvin temperature times the natural log of the reaction quotient. All right, so we should know most of, uh, we should be familiar with this from the last chapter. So the standards, standard Gibbs energy of reaction uh, is something that we can often look up in tables. Um, and so what we wanna do then is calculate the Gibbs energy of our system under those specific conditions. All right, so we can then use the identity the change in Gibbs energy is equal to negative NFE from our last slide, and substitute that into this expression. All right, that doesn't look super useful yet, but what happens if we divide by both sides, divide, sorry, by negative NF over both sides? Well, we're left now with what is a really useful expression, the uh, cell potential um, at whatever conditions we might have is equal to the, san the standard cell potential minus then the gas constant, the Kelvin temperature, over the number of moles transferred in that reaction times Faraday's constant times then the natural log of our reaction quotient. So in the uh, previous slides, remember, this, this, we had this expression, the Gibbs energy equals negative NFE cell, and that didn't matter if that was its standard state or not. So now in this expression, we're calculating this value, and we need to know the standard uh, the standard uh, cell potential. So we need to remember what we learned in the last uh, lecture, the last section, section 18.2. So often, 
uh, we'll be given the individual half reactions and we'll need to calculate this um, standard uh, potential of our cell. Also remember Q now uh, is the reaction quotient and so we need to know something about our system. We need to know the concentrations of reactants and products. That can be molar concentrations or that can be um, partial pressures. Alright, so um, often it's a little bit more wieldy to use log base 10 rather than the natural log. And so what I always do is just convert this to the natural or so the log base 10 form. Alright. Um, and specifically if we're running at 25 degrees C, uh, if we're not uh, running at 25 degrees C, you'll need to um, make some modifications to this equation to, to account for that new temperature. Uh, but the cell potential is equal to the, the standard cell potential minus 0 0.0592 over the number of moles of electrons transferred in that reaction times log base 10 of Q. So this is the most common form of the Nernst equation um, at 25 degrees C right here. So all we need to know is again something about the reaction, how many moles are being transferred, and then something about our cell, what's the concentration of all of the reactants and products um, in the direction we have them written. So let's look at an example. Um, Let's consider an electrochemical cell based on this reaction here. Two protons plus 10 metal makes 10 ions plus hydrogen gas. All right, so we want to then uh, pull up our Nernst equation uh, in order to answer the, the following questions, which are which of the following actions would not change the measured cell potential? So here's what we have. We have concentrations, we have number of moles, um, and then we have our measured voltage. So uh, our measured potential. So this is what we're looking at. Is this going to change when we're changing these conditions? So first, if we lower the pH in the cathode uh, compartment, are we going to um, change then the cell potential? First, let's look at what the cathode is. I remember the cathode, uh, a red cat from our, uh, from our mnemonic device, uh, reduction in, uh, is at, happens at the cathode, in this case, um, Hyd uh, hydrogen ions are going to hydrogen gas, their oxidation number is going down, so this is the reduction reaction, so this is the cathode compartment, uh, this is where this reaction is occurring. Alright, so um, if we lower the pH, we're increasing the concentration of protons, and so um, we're going to then affect Q. Alright, here is our expression for Q. All right. Uh, it hasn't changed since any of the equilibrium work we've been dealing with. It is the uh, products uh, raised to their stoichiometric coefficients over reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. So in this case we have protons squared. So if we change the uh, constant, change the pH by lowering it, we're increasing this value and we're making Q smaller. If we make Q smaller, that's going to have an effect on our cell and so it is going to change the cell potential. All right, so B now then says, what happens if we add more tin metal to the anode compartment? So solid tin metal, remember, um, we don't include those in equilibrium expressions because they have an effective concentration of one. Their concentration is not changing as we're adding more metal. And so what's gonna happen is, it doesn't appear in our reaction quotient here, just 10 ions, and so it doesn't affect our overall expression. Um, so adding more tin metal will not affect our voltage. All right. So that will not change the cell potential. So the answer so far is B. Let's see if there are any more. All right, C. Uh, if we increase the tin 2 ion concentration in the anode compartment uh, and ox from our mnemonic device, so uh, oxidation is occurring at the anode, tin, the oxidation number is increasing uh, in, on the product side. So um, that is occurring in the anode compartment. This tin, of course, now um, is in our Q expression. Therefore, um, our, cell, our measured cell potential is going to change. If we increase the pressure of hydrogen gas in the cathode compartment. All right, so here's hydrogen gas. Um, it does appear in our, in our reaction quotient. Here is partial pressure of hydrogen. Uh, therefore, it's going to change Q. Therefore, it's going to change our potential. So it looks like the answer is B. All right, uh, adding more tin metal will not affect our potential. 
All right, let's do some more practice with the Nernst equation. Because again, this is one of the most practical uh, uses of this uh, whole section. So let's consider the, uh, the cell reaction below, starting at standard conditions. So one molar uh, concentrations of copper two and zinc two. Determine the cell potential after the reaction has proceeded enough for the zinc uh, ions concentration to have changed by 0 0.50 moles per liter at 25 degrees C. All right, so we're effectively reducing the concentration of zinc uh, by half, or sorry, or increasing it because it's, um, it's our product. All right, so we need our standard reduction potentials first. So we'll go to our table of standard reduction potentials and pull out these values. Uh, note, in this case, the cell potential for uh, re the reduction potential for copper is a larger positive number than zinc. So this is going to be our, uh, our cathode where reduction is occurring. So it's going to be uh, maintain the direction as written. This zinc reaction, however, should be written in reverse. And we'll need to make this positive in order to get at our uh, overall cell, um, cell potential. So to get the, so the overall cell potential, we take uh, the um, anode, sorry, the cathode side, subtract the voltage from the, um, from the anode, and we end up with our, this value 1.10 volts. All right, so now in the Nernst equation, we have our standard cell potential. So not to confuse reduction potentials with cell potentials is important here. All right, so let's see what we're going to do. Here's our Nernst equation. We have this value now. How many electrons are being transferred? Well, 2 plus to 0, 0 to 2 plus, looks like a 2 electron transfer reaction, and there we go. So now what do we need? We need to figure out what our log, uh, what our Q value must be. So for starting out at standard conditions, we have a concentration um, of our products, in this case, zinc of 1 molar. So what's going in Q here? Well, remember, it's products over reactants. The solid metals don't appear. So it's the concentration of zinc on the top and the concentration of copper, again, both, both their ionic form, on the bottom. Um, and so uh, because zinc is our product, it's going to then increase by 0 0.05 um, or 0 0.5 moles per liter. So it'll be 1.5, uh, and this will be 0 0.5. So now we have log of that value, and we have everything we need to calculate the cell potential, uh, and it's 1.08 volts. All right, so that's, again, straightforward enough. So one thing to note is we've changed these concentrations from standard state pretty dramatically. We've increased this, again, 50%, reduced our copper concentration 50%, and that doesn't change the voltage very much. It's really only um, depleted a little bit. And um, we'll see when we get to the battery section, because of the nature of this um, logarithmic function, um, this value isn't actually changing very much when we take the log of it until it gets close to the extreme uh, ends of that, of that number. To, as we're approaching equilibrium, um, it gets the voltage drops faster and faster. So uh, we have almost no voltage drop um, as long as we still have reasonable concentrations of our, uh, of our ions. Uh, but that will begin to not be the case as we again become uh, very close to equilibrium. All right, so the next thing we might want to do is calculate the equilibrium constant. Ooh, we can enter, we can do all sorts of stuff with this. So if we can calculate the standard cell potential or the cell potential, um, we can then use that to calculate um, well the Gibbs energy, and then we can use that to calculate what the uh, equilibrium constant must be. So this is again capital K equilibrium constant, um, and we have um, again the standard cell potential. We can go calculate that from a table of ha of reduction reactions. So let's look at this one. We have iron metal, uh, lead ions making lead solid, and iron ions. All right, here are our two again uh, reduction half reactions pulled from our standard reduction table. Uh, in this case, the lead half reaction is a uh, larger number, uh, less negative number. So it's going to be our, our cathode, it's going to be where reduction occurs. Iron is going to be then where our um, uh, oxidation is going on. So we're going to need to write this in reverse. The oxidation number will go from 0 to 2. Alright, so we'll take this number, subtract this number, and end up with our overall cell potential. 
All right, 0 0.321 volts. Nice convenient number there. All right, so we have this value. How are we gonna go about putting this into um, figuring out the equilibrium constant? So recall that the Gibbs energy is equal to uh, negative RT, natural log of K. So we now have a way that we can relate the equilibrium constant to the Gibbs, uh, to the Gibbs energy, but we've also uh, defined now uh, this relative to our electrochemical cell. So for redox reactions, uh, we can figure out um, what our uh, standard Gibbs energy of reaction must be. All right, so we take then, uh, again, rearranging this expression, we have natural log of K is then equal to the number of moles transferred times Faraday's constant times the standard cell potential. So this is again away from, or this is at standard conditions, one mole of each, um, over then RT, so uh, the gas constant times the Kelvin temperature. All right, so let's plug in these values now. All right, so we know then um, uh, Faraday's constant, two times 9.6, or we have the number of moles is two. We have Faraday's constant uh, in units of now coulombs per mole electron. So note we are using different uh, units in this case. Make sure we get those uh, right. 9.64 uh, or 9.65 times 10 to the four coulombs per mole electron times uh, 0.321 volts, our standard cell potential. All right, and it's good to put all of the units in here uh, so that we realize what we're going to actually have. In the case of an equilibrium constant, everything should cancel because those are unitless. All right, so we need the appropriate unit for R. When we're dealing with units of energy, we're always going to be dealing with this 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, and then we're at 298K. So uh, we get a result, uh, in, and uh, we need to then uh, use the natural number uh, to determine what that value is. So e to the 25 is 7.2 times 10 to the 10. And so that's our equilibrium constant for this expression. So again, let's think about why this is. Um, if we have a battery, uh, it has the potential to do work. If it has the potential to do work, that, that requires it to be out of equilibrium. Um, and it can be out of equilibrium in a way that um, it can proceed, the reaction can proceed as written or it can proceed in reverse, just depends on how we want to think of it. So, but if it's proceeding as written here, we have energy uh, that is available for driving this reaction forward. So electrons will naturally transfer uh, from then uh, the iron to the lead ions uh, and it will create this voltage uh, until eventually we've converted so much that we've reached equilibrium and when we've reached equilibrium there's no longer energy available um, and so we can calculate that uh, lot, that k value then by using this expression all right so let's look at then uh, another example equilibrium at 25 degrees again when a system is at equilibrium the measured cell potential will be zero. Right? The forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. So in the last example, right, um, at equilibrium, uh, this reaction, iron solid plus lead two, is happening at the same rate as iron two plus lead solid going backwards. All right. um, and again, crucially, uh, the, the equilibrium constant will equal the reaction quotient. They'll, be, uh, they'll both be the same. All right. So if we want to then um, rearrange this in a way that makes, uh, makes more sense, uh, we can get directly to our equilibrium constant. We can derive an expression. So let's do that. So if the, the measured cell potential um, in this case is zero um, because we no longer then have a measurable voltage because we're at equilibrium, um, the E cell is zero. So we know then the standard cell potential from our table of standard reduction potentials. Uh, we then know the number of moles of electrons transferred in that reaction. Uh, this is again specific for, um, for 25 degrees C. If we change the temperature, this will no longer be strictly valid. Um, and then we can calculate then uh, log K if we know all these other values. So rearranging that expression, we end up with a way to, to figure this out. Uh, the equilibrium constant is equal to then 10 to the uh, number of moles times E cell over 0.0592.
And so this is again a way that we can get at equilibrium constants then directly. So we can now again relate um, equilibrium, all we've been working on. Redox reactions are subject to equilibrium just like other reactions are. Um, and so we, if we know the equilibrium constant, we can calculate uh, what the standard Gibbs energy of that cell must be. We can then also use that to interconvert and get what the standard cell potential must be. All right, so let's think about this then for a minute. If we have a Gibbs energy value, an equilibrium um, amount of energy, a standard Gibbs energy, we can calculate the standard cell potential or the equilibrium constant. And again, we can do this for values at 25 degrees C, um, or we can change the temperature um, in as appropriate. So if we know an equilibrium constant for any redox reaction, we can calculate what its standard cell potential must be using these identities here. So again, this is a really useful way to interconvert um, both equilibrium, Gibbs energies, and cell potentials. And so let's look then uh, just briefly at what happens in a variety of situations. If our K value is very small, going back to our equilibrium uh, lessons, if our K value is very small, we know we're going to favor the formation of reactants. Um, the cell potential will be less than zero, it'll be a negative number, uh, and the Gibbs energy of the cell is going to be uh, greater than zero. So we're not really going to have a lot of energy there um, if our you know, equilibrium constant is really small it'll favor the formation of reactants. Uh, if we have a situation where the K uh, is, is reasonably large, especially like 10 to the 12 or more, we're going to have a voltage. So the larger our K value, the larger our uh, cell potential uh, per mole electrons. And then, uh, of course, then the Gibbs energy will be negative, and um, the larger the cell potential, the larger the K uh, per electron transferred, uh, then the more likely we are to have a lot of energy available in the Gibbs energy, um, as the sorry, as the standard Gibbs energy. So we're going to favor the products. It's really going to drive that reaction to the right. If K equals Q equals one, well, we're at equilibrium, and we don't have any energy available. We're just an electrochemical cell hanging out, not doing anything. So nothing happens. All right. So we'll use this information. Uh, in the next section to look at common uh, applications of this, things like um, electrolysis. So electrolysis is uh, driving reactions forward uh, using ele uh, electricity. So we're driving redox reactions uh, forward in order to say uh, plate out copper metal or plate out metal from a, a mixture. We'll also look at batteries and other and then practical uh, applications. All right, and there we are. Batteries, corrosion, electrolysis, Corrosion is one of those processes, there's a huge body of like literature on it because it costs industry uh, probably billions and billions of dollars uh, annually. Uh, corrosion is one of those things that everybody's working on avoiding, um, and it's of course related to what we're studying here. Alright, so thanks for tuning in, and I will see you on the next lecture.